Well, thank you so much for that wonderful special music. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. I think each one of us can say that. Well, Elder John, we thank you for the privilege of hearing what Lord has given you to share with us this morning. So the time is yours. I've already been blessed this morning. How about you? Some sermons that I've given, I have lots of notes in my Bible or on a piece of paper, and other times I have it all on my computer. Today is one of those days that it's all on the computer, and in my mind, I guess, but my computer is not here, so I'm going to be uh, doing lots of hand motions and strange things. You'll know what that's for, <laughs> but uh, I thought this was an interesting picture. Can you sleep through a storm? That's a livestock guardian dog, a Great Pyrenees, French dog. Yeah, uh, actually the royal French dog. But it uh, doesn't look like the bad weather is bothering them too much. In fact, they do better in the cold and in the winter than they do in the summer. The Bible teaches us in Proverbs 133, but whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. There's a lot of people with fear today. And I watch the news and different things, and, and it, it makes me fearful at times. And so this message is not just speaking to you, it's for myself as well. And I don't really normally stand down here, but I need to be able to re read what's on the screen. So... Let's go to the next, oh, next slide, yeah. Big decisions and chain reactions. Tough decisions ahead. Are people facing tough decisions today? Go ahead to the next slide. You know, what makes a difficult decision a difficult decision? It's, it's one of the things that makes it that is either way you decide, you're going to have a problem. Many people today are facing extremely difficult decisions, having to decide, am I going to take the risks of maybe uh, adverse effect from a, uh, a shot, or am I going to lose my job? Go ahead to the next slide. Nearly 600 United Airlines employees losing their jobs after refusing to get vaccinated. 22 military pilots, F-22 pilots, walking away from their job due to the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. Next slide. 127 Washington State Patrol employees lose their jobs over vaccine mandate. I know some around here um, left, and, but praise the Lord, they found jobs in Idaho and other places. But, you know, soon, whether or not we're being affected right now by these mandates or different things, every one of us are going to have to face decisions that will be difficult and are among the most important decisions. Now, I wonder if I could have a volunteer, somebody who can write clearly and can write quickly. Because I write up here on the board and you guys have a hard time seeing it. No volunteers? Julie, you want to come up and help? Okay. So I want to ask the, the question to you, and Julie, if you could just, um, whoops, grab the pen here and make a list of kind of the ideas people come up with. What are some of the most important decisions, maybe difficult decisions, we have to make in a person's life? You can raise your hand and go ahead, and maybe if we have a mic. Marriage. marriage. Okay, number one, marriage. Career. Career. Our, where we're going to work. Yeah, very good. Any others? Can you go back down on the slide? There we go. Um, following Jesus. Okay. So our religion. Would that be a good heading? Yes. Oh, what makes us happy? Yeah. Okay. 
You're referring to a person or anything? anything? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. Any more? Where to move, where to live. Very good. Who said that? Chris, what to eat. Okay. Very good. What we look at, what we watch, what we look at, what we watch, what we do for entertainment. <clears throat> um, what we listen to, good. Any more ideas? Big chain reaction on other things, yeah. Health principles. Health principles. That's good. We didn't have that one on there. Uh, any others? Very good. Um, little day to day, little day to day life. Okay. <laughs> little daily things. Little daily decisions become important, and we don't think they're important. Okay, very good. What about, um, go ahead. What we say. Things we say or not say, how we, what we speak. Very good. How about if we are going to, Harrison? What we do. What we do. All right. How about if we're going to have a family or not? Or adopt a child or something like that? Yes. Uh, we're all in a rush in living cycle to have one. Are we in a rush generational tendency to be told uh, how we've been raised or treated, change who we are? Or do we let God transform us? How do we do, how do we, how we <laughs> how do we hand, how do we react to influences? Okay. All right. Okay. I think we got a board full, so one more. We can put one more on there. If we listen to Christ, we listen to Satan. Mm-hmm. Okay. Who are we going to choose, right? Okay, so now we can go to the next slide. Which of these list here would you want to see in the top five? Oh, it's not too, I'm not, you don't have to be so precise, but I just want to see what's, what do you think are the most important of these? Following God or Satan? That one? I'm not going to say one is higher than the other. We're just going to pick out the top five here. How's that? And we can change it if we think. Following Jesus? Okay. The top two? One more to go. What makes us happy? Where to live? What we eat, what we watch, what we listen to, health principles, little things that we do, what we say, having children, influences, little things. 
<laughs> this is just the, uh, did you have one? There's a, there's a, well, we can. Where to live. Put that as a footnote, yeah. We'll make it a little star. Okay. Okay, go ahead and click to the next slide. This is from Real Clear Science uh, on the internet. And they did a poll of 657 people in the United States and asked them what are the ten, 10 most important decisions in their life. And plotted here is frequency of the different decisions and also importance ranking. And so the ones way over here on the right hand side are um, the ones, so this number here, you may not be able to read it, is 600. So virtually everyone had whatever this little point was in their choice. And then higher up means it was ranked higher. Like some of these way down here only had 50 people, but, uh, but it was ranked really high. And the reason is, is because it was a question or a decision that not very many people thought was a big decision, but those that did all thought it was the top decision. One of those was like uh, what gender you're going to be. So there's not a lot of people that really face that decision, but those that do face that decision, it's a big decision. So it's scored high on the chart, but not really far over because it wasn't really common, if you know what I mean. So we're going to look at these five here, that one, those two, three, four, and these two together, those two little dots, they're almost the same, so I lumped them together. And if you put them together, they actually, you add 275 and 275, you're at 550, it pushes it all the way up here. So the question is, what were those? Well, if we had our computer, uh, we could mouse over things if we were on the internet, and a little pop-up would tell you what the questions were or decisions that people had to make that they thought were really important decisions. But what we can do is click to the next slide, and here's what they were. The most common big decision, the one way over on the right, was what shall I do for a living? Second most was where shall I live? Third was whom shall I marry? Actually, I, these are mixed up. I messed up my slides. Go to the next slide. We, I, oh, I got it all jumbled up. Oh, well. Go ahead and go. This is the same as the previous one, isn't it? OK. OK. This is the one we need to be on. I, got a, I messed it up. So way over on the right was, whom shall I marry? Oh, no. I did have it right. Let's go back. OK. The most common one was, what shall I do for a living? And then, where shall I live? Whom shall I marry? Should I go to college? Should we have children? And the, the where shall I live, that was actually those two points that were way over. And I said, you add them together, and it moves up. It's because they, come, they divided it into like one was finance section and one was house. But really, it was kind of the same, same principle, same thing. And, um, but then when you looked at these five questions on the list where it showed how important people felt they were, that's the next chart. OK. So let's go to the next one now. So here we go. So the number one most important, even though it wasn't the most important to all of them, but by and far, was whom shall I marry? Should we have children? Should I go to college? Where shall I live? And what, should, what work shall I do for a living? So do you think there's a lot of people, now this is in the world, this isn't looking at the church or anything, this is just a poll of random people in the world. If these decisions they think are big decisions, is this the thing that's on people's minds? Especially a lot of younger people, I think.
Do all roads lead to the same place? People, some people like to teach that. Oh, you could choose this religion or choose that thing. It all goes the same place. Have you ever heard that? I've heard that said. Is that true? Well, if you believe the Bible, and also probably by your own experience, you know, I once preached in uh, Folsom Prison in California. It was a um, high security prison. And when I was going to go out there, the guy who was in charge of it said, hey, when you come, whatever you do, don't wear blue. So I wore a black suit. And uh, I'm trying to remember one of these guys that's a real crazy guy from the 70s who, was it Manson or somebody? Had like a Carl, uh, cult type thing. He was there. And... Um, had his own kind of religion, and I was walking through the, kind of like a football field, it's like a big stadium, there's a track, and all the people are milling around, all the prisoners, and they're all wearing blue, and I'm wearing a black suit, and I found out why you're not supposed to wear blue, is because they got these towers, and the guards are there, and these, these white lines, and if a prisoner steps over the white line, they've made the wrong decision, they'll get shot, and so... They want the visitors to stand out quite distinctly from those who are there wandering around on the prison grounds. Anyway, I was never more happy to be representing the Lord with a Bible in my hand and wearing a suit and looking like I fit the part than coming in there with khaki pants on and short sleeves. Because as I walked through to go and give my sermon, the the soldier or the soldiers, the, the prisoners just it was parted like the Red Sea. And many of them were saying, you know, you know, kind of like respectful to the minister coming in. And um, the whole point of this was I preached a sermon about the law of God. Did I have to teach any of those guys that the law of God is still in force today? Did they know that there were consequences, chain reactions that happened from bad decisions that they made? They knew it without a doubt. And it was one of the best experiences I ever had was going to that prison. Let's read the, what the Bible has to say. The whole point of that was, that little spiel, was you can learn things without even reading it in the Bible by experience. And a lot of people are learning that way, and the Holy Spirit impresses them. But also, we can get it very clearly from the Scriptures. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, 22. Let's go to the next slide. One of the things that the Bible teaches when we're trying to make decisions, make right decisions, not end up with a terrible chain reaction or consequence, is doing them in order. First Corinthians or Corinthians 14:40, let all things be done decently and in order. Next slide. Is this list that we came up with, well, we didn't come up with it, really the uh, scientist did, who did the research came up with this after polling 657 people. Is this really a proper order of decisions to be focusing on and trying to solve? No. We can know just from um, experience again, but also from the Bible. We should Ask God for wisdom if we need wisdom on making a decision. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Matthew 6, 33. Can you go back to the previous slide? So we can ask God. He put it in the Bible. Do you know, have you ever been in a crisis, a personal crisis, where you had to make a tough decision? Or maybe you knew you made some bad decisions and now you're in a lot of trouble and you need to get out of trouble. And you find a verse like the one we just saw. I've been in situations like that where I said, God, you said this, and I'm glad you did, but you're God and you cannot lie. That means you've got to abide by this. And I felt a little bit funny talking to him that way. But actually, from my understanding, God likes to have us use his own words as reason for him to do what he needs to do. 
So he promised to give us wisdom. So what I'm saying is, hold him to the promise. And he will, he will deliver it. <clears throat> a lot of people, oh, can we go back to that slide? A lot of people, their thoughts, especially young people, is all around boys and girls, who I'm going to marry, and let's say they, they get the apple before the horse before the cart, excuse me. Can you imagine a horse trying to walk down the road with a cart in front of him and pushing it down the road? That just really wouldn't work. Get yourself in a lot of trouble. And You know, you can go through these scenarios. I could just give you one real quick scenario. How about a young man who doesn't have a career yet? He doesn't have a job or know what he's about. But he thinks he's, he's gone to college and he thinks he's found just the perfect wife. And yet he still doesn't know what he's going to do. And now he's going to take care of a wife and himself and he hasn't taken care of himself yet. Is that lining up for potential problems? Now, God can get people out of these problems, but he can also save you, for a lot, save you from a lot of heartache if you do things decently and in order. And um, don't move the slide yet. Say the young man does get married, and she happens to be a good wife, ends up being a good wife. And together, God's going to bless them and help them, but... He hasn't made a decision yet on exactly what he's going to do for work. He's doing odd jobs or different things. Now that he's married, his situation has gotten way more complicated. Because before, it was between him and God, and maybe some advice from his parents who cared about him. About, you know, should I go this way and do this work? Should I go that way and do that work? But now guess what? Now you've got a wife dependent upon you. And you've got a wife's Mother and father were saying, uh, you're not going to go and do that job. My wife needs somebody that can you know, earn a lot more money or whatever. You can't go working at the Review and Herald for pennies. You should go take that job in the, working for that other school. Can you see how that scenario could happen? And um, so it's a good idea to have these things straightened out beforehand the Bible makes a lot of sense when it gives us these wisdom about decisions, doing things decently and in order. You could go down through all this list and see how each one of these things could be affected by doing them out of order. Let's go ahead to the next slide now. And the next slide. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Again, here's another promise that God will lead us in the right direction. Now, sometimes the, I think we have the hardest time in determining God's will or trying to make a decision is when we kind of know what's right to do, but we would really rather do something else. And the difficulty is trying to harmonize the two, if we're really honest with ourselves. Okay, let's go to the next slide. What about this tidbit? If you're looking at that list, here's a piece of wisdom. It says, prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field and afterwards build thine house. So, like our first example, should we get married, build a house, build a family, and then figure out, okay, now what am I going to do? Or where am I going to work? Now, sometimes we may get into those situations from Maybe our own circumstances or circumstances that are out of our control will throw us into different situations. But God has promises for that as well. But if we would make it easier on ourselves on the straight and narrow path to heaven, if we do things God's way, God's way we will have um, an easier time. Not necessarily a lot easier because... God's ways are often the stony, stony ways, but in the long run, we'll be happier. You know, I read about the riots. I hear about the riots in different places. And like Chicago, this year has already passed 1,000 people dead from gunshot wounds. I mean, thousands of people have been shot. Thousands of them have died already. It's, they're breaking a record. 
I sure am happy that I'm not living in the middle of a big city in America today. And um, following God's principles in the Bible on any subject, sometimes it's more difficult, sometimes it's inconvenient, sometimes it seems like you're going backwards, but in the long run, someday you'll be very happy, especially if you end up on the sea of glass where he could have made a wrong decision that might have led you totally down the wrong road and left you where you didn't want to be at that time. Let's go to the next slide. So if we were to take these and arrange them around, according to the way the Bible might indicate, let's go to the next slide. Here's kind of a more proper order, just based on a couple of the verses that we took, took a look at today. What shall I do for a living? Should I go to college? Does the job that I'm going to do require me to go to college? Where shall I live? Can I do the job that I'm trying to do where I want to live? Or is there a place to, a place to live where I want to do this job? Whom shall I marry? Will it work with her and, or him in this job or career that uh, I want to do? And then should we have children? I think a lot of people in the world and in our church get them mixed up and get their lives ruined because they get things out of order. They get things out of order, they get under a lot of stress, and so then what do people do when they're under stress? They try to relieve stress by going out and drinking, and then they get in car accidents or DUIs and divorces, and just from little small things, little small decisions, big decisions, improperly made or, or in the wrong order, um, can end up in a chain reaction that gets us in a very bad place. Let's go to the next slide. Theodore Roosevelt said, in, if any moment of decision, in any moment of decision, the best thing to do is the right thing. The next best thing to do is the wrong thing. And the worst thing to do is nothing. Sometimes we are so worried about making a big decision that we don't make any decision, kind of let, uh, what do you call it, um, circumstances just carry us away with every way it's going to say and say, well, the Lord, whatever way it is, it's the Lord's, well, maybe not. Maybe the Lord gave you some ideas, but you didn't want to do it. Now you just kind of want to throw a coin up in the air and see what happens because you think that's better. I mean, People probably don't actually do that, but they're doing it by delaying. Do you think this guy had any wisdom? He's just a worldly person. I want to show you something. Um, go to the next slide. <clears throat> now, this is dealing with the Lord's work in his institutions. But the principle is it can be applied to other things. Sometimes various ways and purposes, different modes of operation in connection with the work of God, are about evenly balanced in the mind. It's hard to make a decision. But it, is, but it is at this very point that the nicest discrimination is necessary. It means the closest, carefulest. It might be off just by a little bit. And if anything is accomplished to the purpose, it must be done at the golden moment. The slightest inclination of the weight in the balance should be seen and should determine the matter at once. Long delays to tire the angels. You know, I, I've tried to, uh, once in a while, a, a friend of mine, he has a uh, tractor business on Highway 395. He sells, buys and sells tractors. He, he told me that, uh, John, on Facebook, if you see a good deal, he said, good deals don't last. If you think something's a good deal, you have to take, you've got to move. You've got to take care of that golden moment, and you've got to get on it, and you've you got to get it fast. There's been many times that if, you're, if you don't see something if within the first 15, 20, 50 minutes and call and secure it and say, I'm on my way right now, it's gone. Well, it's the same way with the Lord's work. It's the same way with a lot of decisions. There's a golden moment. We need, sometimes we need to make decisions very quickly. Let's go to the next slide. It is even more excusable to make a wrong decision sometimes than to be continually in a wavering position, to be hesitating, sometimes inclined in one direction, 
than in another, more perplexity and wretchedness result from thus hesitating and doubting than from sometimes moving too hastily. I, I sometimes wonder if some of these famous people read some of Ellen White's writings. You know, she is the most popular author in all the world, or at least female author. She's written more than anybody else. When she was alive and speaking, she was speaking to not just Seventh-day Adventists, crowds of thousands and tens of thousands of people would come and listen to her. And um, many people got acquainted with her works. Um, there's been a lot of prominent politicians and people that have either had their wives or their husbands or spouses were Seventh-day Adventists, even though they uh, were not. And I think God uses those people, uses their spouses uh, to help bring them things, gems like this, to help them in their life. Let's go to the next slide. So when we look at this list, this is kind of the worldly list. And our list here that we came up with is pretty close, but it's a little better, I think, because this one really doesn't include God. If this list would be, if we would adjust it to include God, we can go to the next slide. Oop, let's go back one. Well, this is the principle. Seek ye God, seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. Would that make a difference in our list? Let's go to the next slide. Therefore, take no heed, or take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. That's what this poll was. That's what the Gentiles seek after. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Matthew 10, 31. Let's go to the next slide. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Matthew 10, verse 31. You know, it's really interesting as I was putting some of these slides together and thinking about it. It said that the Gentiles, what do they seek after? What they can eat, what they can drink, what they wear. That's what they're worried about. And uh, God says we don't need to worry about that. And I was thinking about our... Um, What are those places called? Where you can get uh, food if you need food, food bank. What do they carry? Clothes, food, water, orange juice, things you can drink, things you can eat. All, this, all the three things that God specified. I really think that uh, those agencies are doing a work for God. And um, God blesses that. But that doesn't mean that that's our work. There's a place for the Salvation Army type work. Those that don't have the truth, there's not a lot else they can really offer to lift the world up. But our work, while we could do that kind of stuff, we have something that nobody else can do. It's like um, Bill Gates, you know, I think he, I don't remember what the actual amount was, but he was, he's really fast at typing. He could type like 100 words a minute or whatever. So say he's He's better. Maybe he can do a thousand words a minute. Just say that's the example. Do you really want him because he's ten times faster than an administrative secretary answering the phones? Do you want Bill Gates there typing away answering the phones, even though he can do it better? We might be able to do the you know the food pantries better, but is that really what you want the Seventh Day Adventist Church to be doing? Bill Ga Bill Gates can. This administrative secretary can't program or write the whole uh, Microsoft code for the new operating system or be able to relate to all the different people who can. They can't take that position. So likewise with us, I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing that work because it's a way to lead in to meeting people. It's one of the methods, one of Christ's methods. But we, not, we are not to lose sight of what our primary purpose and responsibility is here. Anyway, that was kind of a segue or sideways thing. Let's go to the next slide. So here is um, kind of adding God's order or maybe the way we might look at it. I thought it came out to look pretty much just what, uh, what we came up with here. God's kingdom and his righteousness first. That's the number one and most important thing. What is his will for our life? 
what should we do for a living? And in thinking about what we should do for a living, can I glorify God by doing this? How can I glorify God by doing my work? Does it require college? Where shall I live? Can I live in a place that is beneficial for me to grow spiritually and be ready for Jesus coming while doing this line of work? That's putting God's kingdom first in your decision. It starts to make things easier if we want to do that. Whom shall I marry? Will who I marry increase my usefulness for God and my uh, community? Will my usefulness for God increase by my having children? These are questions. When you bring everything into how it will fit into seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness, starts to narrow it down and help us when we're faced with decisions. And the poor people in the world, unfortunately, don't, they don't have the resources that we have. You know, we have the Bible, which is really our number one resource. But we also have the Bible expounded. We have the thousands and thousands of pages of writings on every different topic and specific situation based on Bible principles through the spirit of prophecy that will help us even further to determine what are we to make of this and how are we to make a decision. I'm thankful, thankful for that, aren't you? Let's go to the next slide. It says, and they overcame him, Revelation 12, 11, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. I don't want to just make this be the show all about John. So I want to give a couple people opportunities to say if there was a time in life that they had to make a big decision, maybe what was that decision? And um, was there any Bible verse or how did you come to making that decision? And if we have any microphones, we can pass them around. So again, Joel back there has one. give you a chance to share your testimony and here's a Bible promise we can claim. It says that how do we overcome Satan? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So here's just a little bit of a testimony time on maybe a big decision you had to make. When uh, I was considering moving from Ohio back to the Northwest, I applied for a position in Spokane and I, they flew me out, paid for my ticket, took me out to dinner, I interviewed, there was two positions, and, and they were interviewing three people, and they chose to hire the other two people, and it wasn't the first time I'd been turned down for a job, but it felt like the first time. I'm like, what happened? And I called Robin and asked Robin, said, Robin, what do I do? And he said, well, you know, eventually somebody may end up leaving here, and if that happens, I'd really like you to apply for the job. And it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I went, wow, if I'd taken that other job, I wouldn't be able to apply for this job. And it wasn't, it was less than six months later that Robin called me up. I just signed a contract for another position in Ohio. Did you sign that contract yet? Yeah, I just signed it and mailed it on Monday. Why? Somebody just quit. I said, well, that's no problem. I just have to give them 30 days notice. It won't be a problem. So I gave notice for this new job that I have within the same week of starting. And uh, we're here. So whenever I think, whenever the going gets tough, for whatever reason here, I always think I have to wait for God to open the next door because he clearly opened this door. And praise the Lord. Thank you. You know, that brings up a very important point that I didn't put up here. One of the things we need to remember is how God led us in the past, and oftentimes, he'll teach us the same way. Have you ever tried to teach a, a dog a trick, like to sit or different things? You don't just teach them one time and say sit, and they learn to sit, and you give them a treat. It, you kind of repeat, and you bring them, bring them back to steps that they've already learned, and I notice that God has helped me that way when I have not uh, known which way to turn, one way to the left or one way to the right, all of a sudden I start seeing a similar pattern of something that happened on another time when I know God was leading. Okay, next one. Yeah, hey, mine is similar to Joel's. 
Uh, when we, Susan and I, were considering moving out to the country, God was leading us uh, every step of the way. We had to step out in faith, um, and I know I've heard that said quite a few times today. Um, but when we were seriously praying about moving out of the country, um, I was looking for a new position. I needed to get something that was going to allow me to live in the country. And I got a, a job offer at where I am today. And as soon as I got that job offer, the very next day, I had a recruiter call me. And I actually went and interviewed with this company. And this company was another company in Phoenix. And they offered me the position for more money. They offered me a car. They offered me all of these things. And it's like, why, why is this coming in the day after? It's really, really tempting to just say, well, maybe we won't move to the country now. Maybe we'll move to the country later. Maybe we'll just take this job. And we prayed about it, prayed about it, and God just said, no, you need to move forward. You need to decline that position, move out in the country. And so we did that. And we stepped out and faith and moved up here to where we are today. Amen. But the trick is, I called on that job six months later, and it had been eliminated. Wow. Wow. Praise the Lord. Well, wow. thank you for that testimony. That is... That's just like what we were talking about on this difficult decision because there's kind of a penalty either way. The penalty for coming up here was you're going to lose the potential for a lot of income. The penalty for going there was you'd have a lot of income, but you might end up like Lot and his family, right? And you made the choice to put God's kingdom first. Thank you for that testimony. Yes. So a principle that's really helped me through the years is um, in Spirit of Prophecy, I believe, where she talks about doing the work that lies nearest. I ended up in a situation where I was actually at Young Disciple. I had been in Hawaii, and I ended up at Young Disciple just not knowing what to do next. I had six months left on a visa. And things weren't going how I wanted them to go, and I just didn't know what to do. And um, I was just there for Christmas. I wasn't intending to stay there. But then um, as I was there, a job or an opening came up there at Young Disciple, and I was praying about what I should do, and I felt impressed, just do what's nearest. I knew this probably wasn't gonna be a long-term fix to my situation, um, but I felt impressed that I should stay there, so I did, and I had a good year, or a good six months. My visa run, um, was running out in the end of August, and I, um, just before I was leaving, I met Joel. And that principle, though, has stuck with me, like, through a lot of times where I just haven't known what to do, God's impressed me. Just do what you have to do right here, right now, and do it with your best. And God will show you the next step when he, when he needs, to, when it's the time. So we have to be patient. Yeah. Thank you for that testimony. Ended up being a very good decision. Right, Joel? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shabazz. Yeah, hey. Hey, Brother John, good to see you, man. Good to see um, you. Man. Happy Sabbath. Uh, happy Sabbath. When 2003, when the Lord told me to pack up and move back to the U.S., uh, we were living in Sweden, and, uh, and, and it was all just by faith. We had no money, and, and, the, and we, made it, we prayed. Like, I don't know, it was 1 in the morning we, because the Lord woke me up. I couldn't sleep, and, and uh, you got to go back to the U.S. and start a ministry to reach Muslims. So my wife and I prayed at one in the morning and said, Lord, if you want us to go, provide the money for us to go get her green card and stuff. And the next day we woke up, somebody called us out of the blue. And the first thing they said is, Shabazz, you need money? And I didn't even ask them for anything. They asked us. They sent us money. It was just enough to get her green card and stuff. Amen. And then the Lord said, move. And he said, I have a house for you. And I have a car for you. And, you know, I mean, I'm making it very, 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 very easy right now. Yeah. But it was a hard decision in a yeah. way because, because I didn't know all of that immediately. You know, eventually yeah. God said, I have a car. When I got here, somebody took me to a dealership in Spokane, bought me a van uh, two weeks after I got here. And then, and then somebody called me and said, hey, I have a house. You want to live in it? And we moved to that house. And he said, the Lord told us to give you this house. And... Um, now we're back, fast forward now, today, we sold our home a, a few weeks ago, and now we're, uh, we're probably going to move, and, um, I, and right now, it's a di it, this decision is harder than the one in Sweden that we're in right now, wow. but our previous experience has taught us to trust the Lord all the way through, because mm -hmm. if, he's, if He's with you in whatever decision you make, even if it's a bad decision, it's better than making no decision. Mm -hmm. and um and so this next decision is 
Uh, I have a call uh, for work in Sweden, possibly, with the, with the union, Seventh-day Adventist Union, back to Sweden, can you imagine? Oh or uh, with uh, Steps to Christ Ministry in New York. Okay. So those are the two things. So we're in that decision right now, prayer. I'm asking okay. for prayer. Wow. All right, thank you. So the Lord really has had you go through some walk through the water before it was parted experiences. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, Buck? John, I just, the this, this scripture you've got up there, Revelation 12, 11. Yeah. It's good news, but the end tells us that these decisions, as everyone said, are going to be hard decisions. Then this isn't just a, a once decided, always decided. Right? This is moment by moment, day by day, experience by experience. And it's, it's really trust. It's will we trust him, whether it's moving to the country, we had the same thing happen, we sold our home, moved from the suburbs, and it was seven days before the truck pulled out that we knew where we were going. Because when you buy raw land, you can't camp in the winter here. Yes, and just because you made a decision and you made the right decision That's in right. heaven's eyes, That's right. doesn't necessarily mean that it's all going to work out just rosy That's in right. the worldly's eyes. Amen. See what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, even all with what's going on, people having to make difficult decisions regarding getting a vaccine because of the mandates and people losing jobs. I was thinking about it. There's a blessing even in that. Absolutely. Even if people lose their jobs because they're, they may have never had, uh, you know, a lot of these jobs are really good jobs. They've, they've never had any insecurity of work or anything like that. And so by being thrust into a position where now they are kind of like walking through the water and it hasn't been parted yet, even if they're not Christians, they might now see, hey, God might work out something for them. And they might start having thoughts of, maybe God's looking after me. And it will also give them something to remember and recall when we know the big decision versus the mark of the beast is coming. So by God's grace, they'll have had some difficult things that they had to face, and God got them through it, and now they'll face the big test, and they'll have something to build on. So even things that are difficult and facing us when we're wondering about it, God can use all things together for good, right? For our salvation. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, I think we're running out of time, so let's go ahead and maybe you can Pass this out, maybe get a volunteer to pass one out to everybody. And Josiah. I read one time that it's really good if you have a sermon to uh, give people a piece of literature to take with them. Something uh, to help get the point across of what you're trying to talk about during the sermon. And so this little article is entitled Decisions. And it's front and back. And it comes from the book, The Desire of Ages, believe it or not. Desire of Ages. And I'll just go ahead and read this while they're passing those out. The elder brother of our race is by the eternal throne. He looks upon every soul who is turning his face toward him as the Savior. He knows by experience what are the weaknesses of humanity, what are our wants, and where lies the strength of our temptations. For he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He is watching over you, trembling child of God. Isn't that good news? Jesus is watching over us. Do you fear God? Do you love God? You're on his mind. Go ahead and click to the next slide. Come unto me is his invitation. Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before the Lord. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. The way will be open for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. Have you ever felt like you got yourself in a big mess from decisions? And you know it's your own mess you created? You know what? God has a thousand ways, and we can think of none, to disentangle us. Isn't that good news? <clears throat> the weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest in casting them upon the burden bearer. The rest that Christ offers depends on conditions. But these conditions are plainly specified. 
Take my yoke upon you, Jesus says. The yoke is an instrument of service. Cattle are yoked for labor, and the yoke is essential that they may labor effectually. By this illustration, Christ teaches us that we are called to service as long as life shall last. We are to take upon us his yoke, that we may be co-workers with him. You know, when you look at this list of decisions, or the one that came up from that poll, when you add seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness to those decisions, it makes it a lot easier to figure those things out, doesn't it? The yoke that binds to service is the law of God, the great law of love revealed in Eden, proclaimed upon Sinai and in the new covenant written in the heart, is that which binds the human worker to the will of God. If we were left to follow our own inclinations to go just where our will would lead us, we should fall into Satan's ranks and become possessors of his attributes. Therefore, God confines us to his will, which is high and noble and elevating. He desires that we shall patiently and wisely take up the duties of service. Next slide. The Bible tells us that Satan is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, looking upon his prey. The prey sees that the lion's out there, although not all the time. Leopards, lions, cheetahs, they have spots, things to camouflage them. So Satan works very stealthily in seeming little decisions to try and get us off track. As he stealthily approaches, Satan has uh, angels that work with him, his fallen angels. There is a whole host of uh, principalities and powers in high places that work against us at times. Sneaking up, trying to get a hold of us. Next slide. Sometimes we're alerted to his ways and we, with the flock or the herd, can make a run for it. But what about the little lambs? It's harder for the little lambs. Sometimes we big people, we can make a decision that we think, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't make this decision, but I'm going to do it anyway. But you realize that you may recover yourself from that decision. But the little ones that are watching may not. Next slide is a little bit hard to look at. But what it is, is a mother deer. The photographer just happened to capture this photo right at the time that the mother deer was sacrificing itself for his two little ones to get away from the cheetah. That's what Jesus did for us. He let Satan come and kill him, put him on the cross so that we could be saved and get away. Next slide. I wonder if the little deer saw his mother. We should be paying attention to what Jesus did for us. It'll be a little bit easier for us to make the right decision. Next slide. Is there any more? That's it. Let's close with our closing hymn. Our hope is built on nothing less 